Hello everyone, this is Jason from Primetime Aquatics and I am so excited to talk about this subject because it's been something that I've been thinking about for a while and that is how has my science background actually led me to be a better fish keeper and how do I incorporate the science that I've learned over the decades into fish keeping? I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. Really appreciate you being here. So I don't often talk about this on the channel, only when it's relevant in certain subjects, but I have a master's degree in biotechnology and chemical science. I've done a master's cert in aquaculture and fish health. I've been a professor of biology and microbiology now, well, for about 16, 17, 17 years, actually. Wow, that's really kind of crazy to think. Just said that out loud for the first time in a long time. And what I've tried to do over the last seven or eight years that we've been on YouTube is bring you some of that background knowledge. And that's what's helped shape some of the things that I say on this channel throughout the years. But I wanted to talk about five ways that my science background has really helped me in fish keeping. And I hope it will help you as well. First thing, probably the most important is truly understanding the concept of filtration and what it means. I've talked about this numerous times but there's three types of filtration, biological, mechanical, and chemical filtration. And what I have absolutely come to realize through my education and in fish keeping for the last, oh, I don't know, almost 45 years or just about 45 years, is that a lot of times we have way, way, way more filtration than we actually need. In fact, I did a video all about it. I'll put it in the upper right-hand corner as well as in the description below if you want to check it out. But in that video, I explain that for the most part, when it comes to biological filtration, we actually need very little. And in fact, in some of our quarantine tanks, I might have, let's say, temporarily 50 or 60 quarry cats in a 20 gallon long with only one small Hydro 2 sponge filter and never have an ammonia spike. And we bring in thousands of fish every four to six weeks. And I will put hundreds of fish in a 20 gallon or a 40 gallon just for quarantine. And then they wind up going to the swaps and have never had a water quality issue. And the reason for that is my science background has guided me. I understand that microbes are very tiny and they actually don't need a lot of surface area to accomplish the nitrification process. And that is going from ammonia to nitrite and nitrite to nitrate. And if you don't understand what the cycle is and the nitrogen cycle, again, check out that video in the upper right hand corner as well as in the description below. We will have lots of videos for you there. But that has really helped me understand biological filtration. Now, mechanical filtration, sometimes you need a little bit more just because you've got fish that are stirring up things. And so maybe you've got to go hang on back filters or canister filters, but you actually don't need nearly as much filtration as you might assume. The second thing that my science background has really allowed me to appreciate is how important it is to use high quality foods. And we've done videos about how we feed our fish. Again, I'll put that in the upper right hand corner as well as in the description below. But feeding a high quality food, even though it costs more, is gonna wind up costing you less over the long run than feeding a cheaper, low quality food. And that's the reason why we have partnered with North Fin Foods. And in fact, our entire fish room is fed nothing but North Fin food and it has been that way for years. And please understand, we have high stakes here when it comes to feeding food. Because we bring in so many fish, if the fish are not responding well to the food and they can't eat it or it's not a good quality and we start losing fish, it really impacts us financially. So it's not the typical, hey, I've got a tank, I fed the food and it was minor inconvenience. No, this would be a major catastrophe if our, if our fish were not responding well to our fish food. And it's really important then to make sure that the fish that we have are healthy. And the North Fin Foods, they don't have the fillers, they don't have the artificial colors, and so the, the fish respond much better because what they're actually eating is going into their body to make the energy, to build the components that the fish need. And I have found that the color is better, they're healthier, they're happier, they live longer, we have less bloat, less issues, with food related problems and it really has helped us tremendously. And so I put a lot of value in high quality nutrition going into our fish. The third thing in this is huge and it has to do with water parameters. Obviously I have a pretty strong background in what it means when we're talking about GH and KH and pH, you know, the water hardness and that kind of a thing. But what I also have grown to understand through both my background in the sciences and keeping fish for, like I said, 40, 50, 45, 46 years, is that fish can with, often fish can withstand a wide range of water parameters. And not only that, but sometimes 
the wild type parameters, the parameters that you find in nature where these fish are often found, may not be fully appropriate if the fish have been bred in captivity and have never experienced those water parameters. And so sometimes you'll see fish mixed in an aquarium in one of our videos. For instance, I got a whole lot of pushback because at one point in 150 gallon, I had a geophagus from South America with a frontosa that is a Lake Tanganyika cichlid from Africa. And they are found on different parts of the world. And the argument there was they need wildly different water parameters. And my argument was, well, when you have a fish room like we do, or even if you've got multiple tanks, do you actually change the water parameters for every single aquarium that you have and ensure that all the fish in that aquarium come from the exact same location? Because just because something comes from Africa doesn't mean that it requires hard water. Now the frontosas do, but you have all the riverine cichlids, you have some of the satellite lakes, and just because, just because something comes from South America doesn't necessarily mean it's always found in super soft water with a low pH. In this case, because all of our tanks have the exact same water parameters, a GH and KH of around 10 degrees and a pH right around eight, all the fish that you've ever seen in our videos over the last almost eight years, seven and a half years, have had those water parameters. And so I'm not using water parameters as a as a guide necessarily to how I'm keeping fish together. In that particular case, it was more about the fish behavior, their typical aggression levels, and most importantly in that case, what they eat. And if their diet is similar, the water is not changing. If I would have put those geophagus in a different tank, nobody would have said anything, but the water parameters would have been exactly the same as that 150, same thing with the frontosa. You could make an argument that the water parameters are more ideal for the frontosa than the geophagus, but we have kept and bred geophagus for a decade in our water parameters without any issues. And again, it was the science background that I have that allows me to understand that there is a range of water parameters. It's not a necessarily a one size fits all for every single type of fish. Now, yes, if you're breeding wild type fish or you're bringing in wild type fish, yeah, for sure, then you have to adjust your water parameters if you have those wild caught fish that might be a different situation. Or you've got fish that have just traditionally been very, very finicky, like Altum angels or maybe some discus. The fourth thing that my science background has allowed me to understand, and that is sometimes fish die. In fact, I did a whole video about why fish die. I'll put that in the upper right-hand corner as well as in the description below if you want to check it out. But sometimes fish die, and it's not something that you did. I mean, all fish have a typical lifespan. And even if you have the best quality, the best water parameters, you feed them the best food, you give them the best environment, the, the tank mates are all, all great, so there's no bullying. Fish, sometimes they have bad genetics, and we're finding this more and more and more in our fish room throughout the years. I'll give you a couple really good examples, bettas. Over the years, bettas have become less and less hardy, and I think that's just due to all the line breeding. They're more prone to tumors, their life expectancy isn't as long. Another really good example for us has been Daniels, the zebra Daniel, which had traditionally been just, oh, it's a bulletproof sort of fish, a beginner fish that anybody can keep. I have actually found that not to be true just because they are so overbred. The other really good example are some of the guppies. For the same reason as the betta, some guppies are just so line bred to get certain finish, to get certain colors, that they wind up not lasting that long to the point, and I've told this story many times, when I was buying guppies from the big box stores, I couldn't keep them alive for more than a three or four weeks, and then they would all just fizzle out and die. Once I started obtaining guppies from guppy breeders, through fish clubs, and quality breeders, the experience was completely different. And so one of the things that I've tried to stress in our videos from time to time is sometimes it's not something you're doing. Sometimes you really have to pay attention to the type of fish that you're buying and where you're getting them from, because it could just be or genetics due to excessive line breeding or excessive breeding. The last one I wanna talk about today, and trust me, there's a lot more, maybe we'll do a part two. If you want a part two, leave that in the comments section below. Like, yeah, I would really love to hear more. But this last one, and that is, your aquatic plants probably don't need nearly as much attention and fertilizer as you think they do. And I know the fertilizer industry is a big industry, and I'm here to tell you that if you've watched our videos over the last seven and a half years, and you've looked at all the planted tanks that we have, we don't use fertilizer. We do not use liquid fertilizer. And the only root tabs that we will use is when we first set up a tank and the, the soil, uh, not the soil, but the substrate, the sand or the gravel is sterile. We will put homemade root tabs in those tanks 
And that's it, one time, and that's all. And then we let nature take its course. We let the fish produce ammonia, and we've got the plants there that can convert ammonia, can convert nitrate eventually into usable nitrogen-based compounds, which is usually amino acids for protein synthesis and building structure or helping to build structure. And so all the plants that you see, all the planted tanks, the one behind me, I've got them all over the gallery. I still have a bunch in the fish room. No fertilizers. Now, keep in mind, we are not typically growing very difficult plants. We're not growing high light plants. We're not growing plants that would often really benefit from CO2. But the overwhelming majority of the plants that you would find in your big box stores, what I would consider to be low and medium light beginner-ish plants, they really don't need much. If you've got good light and you have a sufficient stocking level, they're going to do great. In fact, we did a whole video on great beginner plants. We've done videos on how to start a planted tank. I'm going to put that in the upper right hand corner as well as in the description below because I think it's a really important video if you're into planted tanks. But you really don't need that much for things like Anubias and Crips and Jungle Val and Guppy Grass and Hornwort and Bacopa and all the plants you've ever seen us have, no fertilizers, especially after we first set up a tank, just some root tabs. So those were five ways that science has helped shape our fish keeping, made it a little bit less stressful for us, more successful, and allowed us to keep a lot of different types of fish in a lot of different types of environments. Would love to hear from you down in the comments section below. Have you ever used science-based knowledge to increase or enhance your fish keeping? As always, we, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. We'll see you in the next one.